Welcome to our latest rebroadcast, podcast number 82. Trials reveal our true selves as well as refine our lives, featuring Mike from COT. This episode originally aired on May 27, 2024, exclusively on CouncilofTime.com. For more details, check the link in the description below. Join Michael from Council of Time as we explore eschatology and navigate today's challenges in this captivating episode number 82. Trials reveal our true selves as well as refine our lives. To gain deeper insights, visit the Council of Time's official website linked below. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction and seeking divine guidance. Your support helps us guide individuals towards truth, sobriety, and preparedness for the perilous times foretold in scripture. Join our exclusive Locals community for EGP family members and enjoy early access to exciting content. Thank you for being an integral part of the End Generation Project's success. Before getting into today's rebroadcast podcast, episode 82, titled, Trials Reveal Our True Selves As Well As Refine Our Lives, we're thrilled to introduce our brand new merchandise line. Our selection includes high-quality t-shirts, mugs, and bags, each designed to inspire and remind you of your faith journey. Every purchase directly supports the operation of this channel, helping us to continue creating valuable content and providing guidance. Soon we will have a live store right here on our YouTube channel. Stay tuned for some real exciting updates coming tomorrow. Your support through these purchases is vital. It allows us to reach more people, offer more insightful episodes, and expand our mission. By shopping with us, you're not just getting great products, you're making a meaningful impact on our community. Visit our store now to explore our collection and help sustain our efforts. Thank you for your continued support and generosity. May the Lord your God keep you all, always. Blessings. Good evening, everybody out there. Well, hope you guys are doing okay today. Well, I hope you are. I know it's been a challenging couple of days. Don't worry, you're going to get through it. All of us will. In fact, I'm quite, uh, I don't know about you guys, right? I don't know about you guys, but I'm quite encouraged by some of the transition, transitional patterns I see with some of the folks in the world today. I am. I am. I really am. You see... We're regular people. Many of us have been through transitions, and many of us have fought some pretty dark forces in this world, but the Lord carried us through all of them. Many of us have been in some bad spots, very questionable spots, lots of pressure, but the Lord has carried us through all of them. The Lord did that. See, we're not sure how we got through everything, but we did. We did everything. Everybody here that can hear me, all of you guys interacting in the chat room, you're here. That's amazing. You know, I can look at the course of my own life and I should not be here. I really should not be here. But I'm here, and not just to have life, because that would be boring to me, right? But I have a belief. I have a passion, and that passion is connected to the Word of God. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. He really does. He is extremely delicate with us, and he's absolutely thorough with his deliverance process. And by the many blessings many things he's carried us through. We're here. We can take from that. He will continue to deliver us. He's going to bring us all the way home. Each and every person who believes in Christ. You have a, you have this absolute confirming promise over your head that you will be brought all the way home. All the way. The Father never makes a misstep. We can't comprehend him in his totality. We can't. But we do know 
is very caring. And everything he does, somehow, it works out. It develops our character. It does. Look at what we've been bought through. And when you see this in the world, his deliverance process has not stopped. I'll tell you something. There are good people, good people who love the Lord, right? But they may not be as well-rooted as you are. So they may have some hang-ups here and there. Have hope for them. Continue to pray for them. If you see them out and about, they get engaged in something. Still have a hope for them. Never give up on people, right? You know how they say that Israel is the apple of God's eye? Did you know in the New Testament, that's been broadened, God's people has been broadened. You're grafted into the branch. And so those who believe in Christ are the apple of his eye. In fact, they are his heart. In fact, they are the reason he's bringing everything about. To finally separate all of darkness from all of light. That's awesome, isn't it? He's going to separate it permanently, finally. No more processes like this. He's going to separate darkness and light. You just so happen to be in that generation that's seeing everything. I mean, you have an ability to see everything come to pass. You're the first generation that's had this capability. And look how much is escalating. Don't be disheartened by what you see. Understand, it's part of God's process. It is important. You have people out there who believe in Christ, but sometimes they also believe in these worldly methods and ways. God will deliver them too. He must show them the truth of what they're handling. And when he does, they too will cling to the Lord. They will. That's how he delivers that's so how he's always delivered. And if you're familiar with that process, you're certainly not discouraged by what you see in the world. But you have an understanding that with or without us, he's going to fulfill what he promised from the beginning. And there's no error in his deliverance. That means you will be fully delivered. That's why you shouldn't be afraid of words like tribulation. You shouldn't be afraid of phrases like God's wrath. God's wrath is meant for darkness. You will not endure God's wrath. You won't. People speculate and have their ideas, but there's some out there in the world. God has given a few things to when his word comes to pass. My goodness. Hmm? Because everything he does is for your growth. Now, let's go ahead and let's admit, right? A, a young child, for the most part, is not going to send themselves through school. They won't do it. There were so many times in school we had to be forced to get up and go to class. There were so many times we did not want to go to school. There were times in school we did not want to take a test. There were times when we took that test, we didn't want to answer certain questions. They were too hard. We did not want to study. We didn't. So when it comes to testing, right, we're not always enthusiastic about it. But a test does what? It qualifies. Does it not? It challenges a person to see what they really know. See, with the Lord, when you go through a trial or tribulation, when there's turbulence in the land, you find out what you really are. You find out what you're really vulnerable to. You find out what you're really good at and what you're not so good at. Upon finding these things, your life is refined. Because then you're walking in truth. See, if I am walking in life, and I really do believe that I'm good at something, but I've not been tested in that specific thing, I could be walking around in a lie. I could base my character, I could base my future upon an ability I do not have. Until the Lord tests what we're holding, we don't know. But when he does, sometimes things can fall apart in your hands. That's okay. He does that for your deliverance. See, because that thing you've been holding on to may not be as holy as you think. And when it falls apart, 
in your hands, you'll finally have the ability to let it go. You'll see the truth of it, and you'll say, this is not what I thought it was at all. Thank you, Lord, for that deliverance. Always, in hindsight, you can look back, and you can see that whatever the Lord has taken from your life was not holy. See, we're seeking the Most High, who is holy. Why would he want us to have unholy things? We ourselves, we can't always see the truth of what we're holding, of what we have, of what we're good at, of what we're not good at. We can't see the truth of it. We cannot see what our skill sets complement. I had some skill sets that complemented darkness and darkness alone. I thought they were good skill sets until the Lord showed me the truth, right? When I saw the truth, I said, nope, that's not for me. And I invested my time in something else. Had I not known that, it would have converted me into something I don't want to be, right? So when the Lord exposes what we hold, he does so for our deliverance. And every year, every week, he's been delivering us from something. We're always in a process of deliverance. All those things we held on to that did not last, right? They didn't last for a reason. It's kind of like having a mortgage that's too high. And you're doing everything you can to hold on to that house and it's robbing you blind. Yet, for some reason, you can't move on. You're stuck until one day your insurance lapses. Some storm comes and tears the house down. You can't have the house anymore. You've got to move on. Immediately upon moving on, you're heartbroken because you lost your house. You had no insurance. you got to find something else. But then the Lord, slowly but surely, he starts to build up your life in steadfastness. So you don't get everything at once, but piece by piece, he rebuilds your life into something without the heavy weights and stresses. And then five years from that point, you, you look back on your life and you'll say, wow, I did not know how to get rid of those weights. I was in the wrong area. It was spiritually wrong and everything else. Had the Lord not had me go through that, I would not have been delivered. And right now I'm free from those burdens. Hmm? See, we can't deliver ourselves because we can't see the truth of all things. But the Lord does. He knows how to deliver us. These Manifold losses that you have here on this earth. Take note. Take note. If the Lord has taken something from you, then that thing was taken from you. That thing had you in prison. That thing can have you stuck. It can glue your feet to the ground, and you'll never grow spiritually. Some of you have been in environments where you could not grow spiritually. Hmm? You couldn't. Because of the folks around you. They were nice people, but some of them did not love the Lord. And because they did not love the Lord, it caused you to compromise in your conversation with them. Then all of a sudden, some unfortunate thing happens. Friendships are broken. You feel alone and isolated. You lost your friends. But the truth was, the truth was, the constraints of your life, which were those people, God separated you from them. You couldn't do it yourself. You couldn't bring yourself to do it. You saw no need to do it. You always thought you could overcome it. But now when you look back, you'll say, wow, it was five, six years, and I did not grow. I was starting to go backward. Had the Lord not broken it, my eyes would not have been opened to his truth in so many ways. See, the Lord knows what he's doing, and that's multiplied by each person in this world. Each person, as we mature, that's when we stop complaining because we start to understand these processes. When somebody is not mature, they do complain. That's why when a person is complaining, encourage them. Don't condemn them. Encourage them. When a person is going through a hard time, encourage them. Don't condemn them. Encourage them. When things are going absolutely wrong, that's why people say trust in the Lord's way because we cannot see. The chains he's breaking. All things, everything he does will edify you. Do you know that? Nothing he does is to break you down. Everything he does is to grow you, is to take burdens from your life. 
is to deliver you from darkness you never knew was there. Do you, do you know how many people, they reject the Lord and they find themselves in these positions that they can't escape? I mean, if you, if you think you know what hopeless is, you got to run across some of these people who have rejected Christ and look at their lives. Some of them have lots of money. They are dead inside. I mean, dead inside. The Lord doesn't want any of you like that. He doesn't. I've seen a person who, it looks like they had everything. They were miserable every day of their lives. They drank, they did whatever they could do to escape the misery every single day. And they had multi, they had lots of millions of dollars. But they were ready to die every single day. Trust. The Lord knows what he's doing. Somebody says, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll answer some questions today. I'm sure that you guys have lots. So let's go ahead and we'll do that. We'll do that. Somebody, Kennedy says, what are your thoughts on them finding President Trump guilty on all charges? And thank you for what you're doing. I'll go more and more. To, okay. What are my thoughts on Trump having uh, all those charges? Well, it, it, for yourself in this perspective. If you've ever been in the hot seat, I remember a time, guys. It was my responsibility. And it was under my watch. Hundreds of millions of dollars of equipment. It was damaged. Now, the buck stopped with me. It was with me. I was blamed for that in a hearing. I was. You know, when I was in that hearing, I was like, oh, my goodness gracious. And it wasn't through negligence. It's not It's not through negligence. It's not though, you know, I went out there and did it myself, right? It's not what it was. They ultimately found a couple of uh, platoon leaders and platoon sergeants were neglected some of their responsibilities. But it stopped with me. I had the ultimate responsibility over that equipment. It was very expensive. And so I was the one who took the hit for that, right? So it did not look good. It it just didn't look good. As a consequence of that, as a result of that, that caused me undue pressures, right? It really did. Now, I'm not sure about the whole process, but about a year later, I'm going to go to, you know, to check on some things and to, because you have to deal with that. When you do something like that, every, all your peers know about it, right? So all of a sudden, the, the attitudes changed. This happened after about 12 months of going through absolute misery. Um, But everything changed. Well, for some reason, they never let the investigation go. They looked a bit deeper. They dug up some laws and and regulations, policies. And I was totally, I was totally absolved of all that stuff. The buck didn't stop with me. Isn't that something? All right. I don't know how that happened. That normally does not happen. And it was something I was prepared to deal with. No big deal. What it did end up doing was it showed me something about the pressures you're going to have to deal with. Now, hear me. The pressures I would have to deal with if I were to continue to go forward, which I did uh, a few more years of my life. But I had to deal with untold pressures. Had I not been through that, I would have folded at the first, uh, uh, you know, some of the pushback in the direction I was going. If I did not go through all that high pressure, right? If I did not have to deal with that umbling moment, that moment of absolute guilt and everything else, if I didn't have to deal with that, I wouldn't have been strong enough to overcome what what lay ahead. I didn't know what was before me. I didn't know what was, you know, going to be difficult in front of me, but the Lord did. So it seems like the Lord had me go through this 
so I could be strong enough to overcome what was coming against me. Anyway, and sure enough, it was, it, my strength was a direct consequence, or I should say a result, of going through all those hearings, all those talks, eating crow, you know, the whole nine yards. And I was not phased. Now, when you're not phased by something, it does not, it does not take away your quality of life. Quality of life is not always money or things like that, right? It's normally peace of mind. So nothing was able to take away my peace of mind. Why? Because I had gone through much heavier things, right? I was still able to soberly operate and function in my capacity at the time, and I did so. Many other people broke, and they really didn't understand the strength of resolve I had within me. Well, it was because I had just gone through something, right? Just went through something. In the Bible, the Lord does this to everybody that is utilized. He does. He does. You, you can look at anybody God used. And they went through something, and it did not look good for them. And it was of normally of no fault of their own. It's just something they go through, right? He strengthens people that way. In the disciples' cases, sure they did things. Peter was a cursing fisherman. Right? He was. You had, you had tax collectors who were willing to rip off their own people, place a burden on their own people, this, that, and the other. But God used them, having gone through that. Because when you know, when you find out your lifestyle is cruddy, right? That what you've been doing is far less than admirable. It humbles you. It also makes you wonder my worth life in the first place and then to be lifted up from that position by the most high to be set on your feet and even promoted that's something else because you'll always say I'm, I'm not qualified for this yet the Lord appointed me right so it's not by your merit you're being put in that position it's by God's love. And sure enough, it's, it's by his power you're kept. Now, when you start walking like that, you realize that your walk is different. When you're walking in authority, but you know that you're in that position by God's love, that you're kept by God's grace, that you are empowered by the living God, right? You're not bragging. Listen to me carefully. You're not boasting. You're not bragging. You're not doing any of those things. You become quite effective, and God can use you in a multitude of ways. If we walk with the slightest bit of pride, in the Bible it says that God resists the proud. Hear me on this. So anybody who's proud, that belongs to the most high, must be broken of pride. It does not mean they're going to lose Anything the Lord has for them, nope. It just means they have to be broken from pride. Anybody who's lifted themselves up, in the Bible it says they must be abased. They must be brought down low. They have to. So they can consider things from a different perspective. Then he'll lift them back up again. See how that works? If I put myself in this position, I'd be a boastful speaker to you right now. But I did not. If I'm effective in any capacity, it has nothing to do with anything, you know, I labor to do. It has everything to do with the Lord's adjustments of my walk. He's the one that put the passion of labor within me. He did that. He caused that. So when it comes to Donald Trump or any other person who would go through what he went through, right, any person who believes that certain things are unlawful, possibly, but maybe they're wrong, and then you have the other side that's out to get him, or, or who may believe that they're doing the legally responsible thing, whatever the case is. If he can reflect upon himself, I mean truly reflect upon himself, and not, not, not use those same tactics used in the beginning, but I mean walk with a sternness and a sureness, of his own faith, 
to be a thousand times stronger, much more refined and useful and blessed above all things in the times to come. Listen, there are dark spirits operating in reality. What people are fascinated over this UFO topic, I am not. I'm not fascinated. And there's no way for me to really communicate to an individual the fullness of why I'm not fascinated. I know it's a, it's a, it's a deadly thing. Those things, all of us are going to have, all of those left on this earth are going to have to face them. Now, who can be in leadership dealing with manifest spiritual entities and things they never thought existed in the first place? Who could lead the people through that? Who could lead the people through death and destruction of a different type when they're spiritually challenged, when these things can mess with your mind and your emotions? can possess people. Who's going to lead the people through that? They're going to have to have some type of spiritual resolve. They cannot be someone who plays around. Whoever leads the people during that time cannot be a person who is prone to giving in to the flesh. They're going to have to be refined in a, in a big way. Wouldn't you say? They're going to have to have uh, uh, the Lord with them big time. Correct? They're going to have to. See, we read the Bible, but sometimes we don't believe the prophecies are coming ourselves. The bottomless pit opening, everybody has their opinion. But it's going to open, and what is going to torment mankind. There are other things that will come. There are things that have been on this earth. They know the truth. They know the truth. They really do know a truth. There are there are documents, recordings, video, letters, testimony, you name it. The proof is so overabundant. If we just take, took the video, you could throw everything else away. It is enough evidence to convince everybody on the planet. See, because after seeing certain videos, nobody would say, well, you know, that could have been something else. They wouldn't say that. They'd be stunned. They'd have a headache. They'd be sick on the stomach. They'd probably fall to their knees and say, Lord, we, there's, we can't, what are we going to, we can't live like this. In fact, I have a habit of telling people, people should be thankful to the living God. They have not seen that other side yet. That you're not exposed to seeing them. Because the day you see them, is the day all of them know who you are and they will see you and they will challenge you. And there's no way for you to get out of it. The Lord has been keeping people, but whoever's going to lead this country during that time, they can't be self-absorbed. They cannot, they, they're going to have to have some, some serious mental strength and spiritual strength and a real relationship with Christ. Because if they don't have a real relationship with Christ, you know and I know, they're going to be absorbed into the beast kingdom. If they do not have the blood of the lamb washing over them, they will end up being an element of the kingdom of the beast. Do you guys see that? All these people out there that are not washed by the blood of the lamb, they have no protection. And they will be totally consumed by the kingdom of the beast. They will be full employees of the kingdom of the beast. They will serve it gladly, and they will all curse the living God. Now, do you want the people that you care about leadership being in that position? Or do you want them covered by the blood of the Lamb? Because if you want them covered, continue to pray. And let the Lord continue his process of refinement. Because if he does not... That's a soul lost. See, while everybody wants what they want, I can't help but to think about people's souls. People's souls are in danger. To be frank with you, to be candid, I could care less about half the stuff that happens in the world. I do care about the souls of people. The soul is eternal. Eternity is a long time to be separated 
from the living God. I know the Lord is doing a quick work. And what that means is where many of us may have had 30 years of refinement. Anybody who comes along now, they may have two years of refinement. They may have a compressed fast track to salvation. We have some serious challenges coming, and they are not conventional. See, it'd be fine if all we faced was an enemy with some missiles and nuclear bombs and chemical weapons. Oh, okay, that's conventional. We're not talking about conventional. We're talking about things that can absolutely damn the soul of the person they absorb. I pray that whomever the Lord picks, whomever he places his hand on to anoint, to lead people in this country, especially those who believe in Christ, that they themselves be of a qualified nature, that they will be an asset to the body of Christ, and that the Lord continue his process in their lives. He will qualify them his way, not our way. He'll do it his way. And we all know by reading the word, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. We know that. We all knew the charges were coming. That doesn't impress me. It doesn't hurt me or anything else. It's the Lord's process I'm interested in. I've seen too much of it. And I know what can happen to a person who does not undergo the Lord's process. I know also that it can cause the real person to surface. And this is something that everybody must prepare for. See, when a person starts going through a trial or a tribulation, no one is forced, no one is forced to walk with Christ. But it will show you who the person really is. So I, I, I give you that forecast here. If a person does not belong to the Lord, they will become so bitter, so bitter that they will begin to hurt everybody around them. They'll become cruel, unrelenting. That's what happens. They become just like vipers. They utilize everything for their own advantage, and they destroy, and they leave a path of destruction along the way. The Lord told us, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Now listen to me, saints. You're not going to know a tree by its leaves spiritually. You're not going to know a tree by its bark spiritually. You're not going to know a tree by what it looks like. You can only know that tree by its fruit. And fruit is what we leave behind. This is a moment of prayer, don't you think? This is a very delicate moment. Whatever the outcome, the Lord's, the Lord's ways are true. Now in the Bible, specifically in the Gospel of John, or in the book of Acts, in fact, let me go here in the book of Acts, a similar situation took place. And I love the principles of our Father. They don't fail. They don't fail. In the book of Acts, as the disciples, uh, they were going out, right? They were jailed. You guys remember that? In the book of Acts, they were jailed. You guys remember that? They went to jail. They went to jail. And you remember when they were released from prison? You guys remember that? They said, hey, don't you preach about Jesus anymore. Don't you do that. You remember, you guys remember that? They said, do not preach in the name of Jesus. Because they were brought before the council. Listen to this. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and the elders and the scribes and Annas and the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. This is Acts 4. I'm at 
verse 6. This is verse 7. And for they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power, by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of a good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is he made whole? Be it known unto you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him who doth this man stand here before you whole, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is to become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given unto men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. They took knowledge of them, that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man that was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside, to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, they start talking, saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Do you guys understand that? He said, well, what, what do you mean? It's in the sight of God. Are we to obey you or to obey God? He said, you be the judge of that. He said, for we cannot speak. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go. Now watch this. Finding nothing, how that they might punish them. Because the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old, of whom this miracle of healing showed. And being let go, they went, they went to their own company and reported all to the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them is, who by the mouth of the servant David hast said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold, their threatenings, they're praying. Now behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. I love that part. They asked for boldness so they would keep, continue to preach the true word of God by the Holy Spirit, not to become shy and to alter the word of God because of threats. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart, one soul, neither said any of them that but all of things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them and bought their prices of things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. You know, this is funny, right? Because conservatives, you remember the, uh, what was it, distribution of wealth? Remember that term? Remember that term? I never liked that term. Do you know why? 
know why I never liked it? Because it, it, I know the person who came up with that dumb term. And you have people who are in politics that know this Bible and they come up with things against the principles of Christ. And then people start echoing these little catchphrases, not knowing the origin of them. I better leave that alone. Let me continue. Let me continue. And Joseph, who was by the apostle surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and bought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's continue. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira's wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and bought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? That was not lied unto men, but unto God. In other words, he deceived himself. He thought he could hide something, right, from the living God. He deceived himself. He didn't have to do that. But his act was against himself, right? So he said, he said, and Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Now, nobody killed him. He fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came upon all them that heard these things. And the young men arose with him and carried him out and buried him. And about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in, and Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. Nobody killed her either. She gave up the ghost. You see that? And yielded up the ghost. She yielded up the ghost. He gave up the ghost. And the young man came in and found her dead, carrying her forth buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. I'm going to bring out a point here now. We're getting to the, to the question Kennedy had here in a minute. But take note of something. Did God kill these two people? No, he did not. Did the apostles kill these two people? No, they did not. So what killed these two people? Anybody know? It's already written in your Bibles. In the Bible, it says when somebody blasphemes the Holy Spirit, they cannot bring themselves to crucify Christ again. Listen to me. Having tasted of the powers of the world to come, having partaken of the heavenly gift, knowing the throne of God, knowing his power, to crucify Christ again is unthinkable. Why? Because they don't know it by faith anymore. They know it by truth. Listen to me. That means they know it by truth. That's what the Holy Spirit reveals. That's why there is no forgiveness when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because you know that you know then. It says in the Bible that a person who does that cannot bring themselves to crucify Christ again. They cannot see him on the cross again. They cannot see it. Even to ask forgiveness of sins, they cannot do it. The guilt is so heavy. The weight is so heavy of what they had done. What they had knowingly done, it is so heavy. They cannot bring themselves to crucify Christ again. And so they give up the ghost. That means, can you imagine guilt being upon you that is so heavy? Your, all your will to live is severed by you. And you... On your own, give up the ghost. Hmm? Can you imagine that? Can any of you imagine that? That is something in it. That is absolutely something. So that's what happens. That's why they gave up the ghost. Nobody killed them. You know, nobody said any words. I've heard people lie. 
and say the Holy Ghost is going to kill you. No, it does not. No, it does not. God does not need to do any of that like man does. That is man. The only way man can get rid of somebody else is through killing them, murder or something. God doesn't work that way. See, people put God in a box. Why do they put God in a box? As though he has to operate like a human to get things done. No, the Lord can simply reveal the truth. And upon revealing that truth of persons, guilt and shame can be so heavy. It will sever all will that they have in life, and they will give up the ghost, and that will be the end of them. You see that? That means God doesn't have to lift a finger. He just simply shows someone the truth. In fact, in the Word of God, by truth, by the truth, God defeats everything. My goodness. By the truth. So Kim says, how did they give up the ghost if we didn't receive the Holy Ghost until Acts 2? Well, this is Acts 4. They gave up the ghost because they had the Holy Ghost. Nope, the Holy Ghost came with the fiery tongues in Acts chapter 2. This is Acts chapter 4. And this is for anybody who receives the Holy Ghost and they operate by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now listen to me. The Holy Ghost has always been with you because that's how Christ is with you. Jesus said so. That's how Christ is with you by way of the Holy Spirit. That's why he said, I will pray to the Father and he will sing you another comforter in my name. And he said, and I will be with you. So he was telling you that by the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God poured out on all flesh, Joel chapter 2, right? That's how Christ is with us via the Holy Spirit of the living God. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. So the Word is with you by way of the Holy Spirit. Now to work or to operate by the power of the Holy Spirit is something different. That is something different. See, because at that point, at that point, you're shown things. You're a partaker of things. Anybody who works by the power of the Holy Spirit has joined with the power of the throne of the living God. So if they ever disrespect, if they ever lie upon, deceive, if they ever do anything like that to the Holy Ghost, they're done for. That's the difference. That's also the step after salvation. This full habitation of the Holy Spirit that you would work like that. Now listen to me, though. Those who work by the power of the Holy Spirit in the earth are partakers of the absolute truth of the throne of the living God by way of a spirit, which means you're not walking by faith. They know. And when you know, you cannot be forgiven. If you do things by faith, the truth is you really don't know. It's by faith you're walking, so you can be forgiven because you don't know. See, here's the truth. If you take a criminal out there, if you showed them what hell was, they would not be a criminal when they came back. So why are they criminals now? Because they don't know the fullness of hell itself. To them, it's just a word. If they could ever go there, they would not be a criminal. Why do I say that? Because even demons are horrified of hell. See, nothing is escaping hell. That means nothing is coming out of hell. That's a man-made nonsense. Why would God make hell? And the demons can just break out when they want to? That means our God is flawed. Do you think I believe that? I do not believe that. I'm against that. Men do not own God's word. Though they act like they do. They do not own it. It's a holy word. It should not be tampered with. But men dream up things by way of a foul spirit to accumulate things unto themselves. And a reckoning is coming to all. Anyway, that's how that works with the power of the Holy Spirit. So nobody killed them, they gave up the ghost. A massive guilt. 
massive guilt. Isn't that simple? So two things here. They prayed for boldness, not so they could speak louder. That's not why they prayed for boldness. They prayed for boldness because they were intimidated by those by, by the law of the land during that time. They were told not to preach in the name of Jesus, and that was law. They prayed for boldness because in order to obey the living God, they had to break the human's law. And they could not preach with that pressure upon them, so they prayed for boldness that they could go forward and to preach what the Lord had given them, not what they make up themselves. They didn't go out there with some violent speech or something like that. That's not what they did. They prayed for boldness that they would not alter the Word of God, that they would continue to preach the Word of God without compromise. And so they did, because it was granted. And then something happened. So we get through these all these Ananias and Sapphira issue, we get to that, right? We get to that. Now we get to this part, Acts 5, 17. Follow me on this. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, made their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people, all the words of this life. What did he tell them to do? Listen to what he said. He said, go stand and speak in the temple to the people, all the words of this life. And when they had heard that they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught, but the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate and the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them bought. But when the officers came, they found them not in the prison. They returned and told, saying, The prison truly found. We shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. In other words, They said, oh, my goodness, if people hear this, we're in trouble, right? Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye have put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and bought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. The people stopped the violence. That goes on today. The people stopped the violence. And when they had bought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not be straightly command thee, to command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be the prince and the savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Take note of that. The Holy Ghost, whom God had given them or those who obey him, not to those who won't obey him, When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Now watch this. Then stood there one in the council of Pharisee named Gamiel, and a doctor of the law. He was a doctor of the law. He had a reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. In other words, give them some room. Give them some room, he says. And he said unto them, ye men of Israel, Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thaddeus, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and bought to naught. See, that's the principle of the living God. Let me finish the rest. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of taxing and drew away much people after him. 
he also perished. And all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. You see that? It, it, the same thing happened. Oh, here we go again. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it'll come to nothing. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest ye happily be found even to fight against God. Did you hear that principle? If something is of men, it will go into nothingness. It's going to collapse. It's not going to work. If something is of God, nobody can overthrow it. Do you hear me? If it's of God, nobody can overthrow it. Do you hear me? If it's of God, God will see it through. If it's of men, it's left to men. Men can do whatever they want, but when something is of the living God, God will see it through. And no one wants to find themselves fighting against the living God because when God issues forth his decree to a person to go forward in something that's called a calling and people start coming against that calling, they don't even know it. But to go against that calling of that person is to go against the living God. And no one has ever been victorious in that type of battle. See, the principles of our Father have always been in place. The problem is, if we continue to follow the world, we cannot remember these principles to have confidence in what the Lord has already initialized. If it be of the living God. Nothing can halt what the Lord has begun. Trust in that wholeheartedly. Now you know. I'll be back in a minute to answer some more questions right here at COT. The question was, what does Jesus mean? And by the way, that is one of my favorite study areas. Why are you guys asking questions in my favorite study areas? Like this is a setup. All right. Gospel of John uh, 14. Let's go there. Let's go there and see. Just in case you didn't know, the Gospel of John is my favorite book. I find it to be well balanced. I do. 14. And in fact, 14 is my favorite chapter. It is. I know that sounds, that sounds uh, cheesy, right? But it really is. It really is. It really is. So the question is, what did Jesus mean about you'll do greater things? Let's go investigate, shall we? Shall we investigate? Let's investigate. Because Jesus said that. And that really stumps people, right? And it shouldn't. It shouldn't. So you have to understand what exactly what Jesus is speaking of here. So here we go. Here we go. John, Gospel of John, chapter 14, if you guys don't mind, turn there real quick. Because this is one of those uh, questions, and a lot of people say, well, I don't see how that's possible. Right? I don't see how that's possible. So you have to understand the, 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 what Jesus was speaking of. The entire, you know, the entire thing. You have to know what he was speaking of. Okay? I'm going to start here in the Gospel of John. 14.10. Very important. Here we go. You guys ready? You guys ready? Uh, Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 10. We're starting at verse 10. Here we go. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Does everybody understand that? Everybody understand that? Gospel of John, chapter 14, 10. He says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. What is he talking about? Well, in order to find out what he's talking about, you have to go back to the beginning of the Gospel of John. And it's quite simple. 
in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, you'll see something. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Right? It talks about, um, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become sons of God, even to them that believe upon his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Right? So, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. He is the word of God. So Jesus speaking, he is the word of God. So, so the spirit Jesus carries is what? Is what? The word of God. What is a person's word? A person's word is them. The word of God is God. Your word is you. Huh? See that? See how that works? And so when Jesus said in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Jesus is telling you that he and the Father are one and the same. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. So then every word Jesus spoke, you just heard God speak. Who that that gives me chills every time I you know go through that, because this you guys you have had the absolute words of the living God, and a lot of people separate Jesus like he's a separate entity from God. No, he isn't. He is the Word of God. Whatever God thinks, Jesus speaks. Whatever Jesus spoke, God was thinking. They are one and the same. That's why he said, "I and the Father are one." He says, believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. That's what he says. Verily, verily, this is Gospel of John fourteen twelve. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. This part is what needs the follow-up, because a lot of people have disconnected this, left it isolated by itself. It does not work isolated by itself. It's incomplete, out of context. So the, the verse again is this. It, it is this. He says, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also. That is true, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. That's also true. But why? Let's continue to read. Here's study moment. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Do you hear that? It's, listen, whatever you ask in his name, who's going to do it? Jesus is. Who's going to do it? Jesus is. Whatsoever you ask in his name. Now, do you guys understand, understand what that term is, ask in his name? Huh? Now, you got to follow me on this, and Lord, help me with this. Because when I go into this, the spirit of offense is hanging on your shoulders. So try and hear me. To ask, let, let, me, let me give you guys the situation. Now remember, we're, we're asking something in somebody's name. A lot of people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I ask for that thing in the name of Jesus. And so they do that literally. Correct? They do that literally. All right, let me give you some correction here. And, and forgive me if I get... Uh, See, listen, every time I get, I start standing up. This is where I break podiums and stuff. I do. I do. I get heavy-handed. And the reason why is because I can almost feel massive spiritual opposition. And it's going to get angry. I'm just telling you now. It's going to get angry. I can perceive it. I won't have to deal with it. You guys will. All right? So know about this. If I, if, the, if, if the president gave me a letter 
And he said, Mike, I want you to take this letter to the Secretary of Defense. Take the SecDef right away. Yes, sir. So I go down and I take that SecDef. SecDef opens the envelope and he reads it and he starts cursing up a storm. Right? Right? Who is he cursing at? He's not cursing at me. Who is he cursing at? The president, not me. Whatever was in that letter, right? Whatever was in the letter, he's cursing at the president. All I did was deliver it. It has nothing to do with me. Okay. Now, did I carry that envelope in the name of the president? I did, didn't I? I carried that in the name of the president. So I carried a message from one place to the other. Now, I'm making this illustration quite plain. Because when you say, uh, you know, I want a uh, new front door in the name of Jesus, nothing is happening. Now, I'm just telling you what I know. Because let me tell you something. Christ never fails. His instructions do not fail. We fail. So I have to get this across to you. If I were to say, Sick death, I'm giving you this letter in the name of the president, right? Or I tell the sick deaf something in the name of the president, and he starts cursing. He's not talking to me. He's talking to the president. But I just passed a message. To do something in the name of Jesus is not to pass a message. Oh, no, it is not. Right? Now, listen to me. That's to do something in the name of Jesus. Right? To believe, to ask something in the name of Jesus is not to pass a message. That's making a request. When I take the gospel from, from the Bible to somebody and they reject it, they're rejecting the gospel. I try to make it all about the gospel, not about me. In so doing, they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, not me. That's why I shake the dust off my feet. All I did was pass a message. I'm not going to get upset because it's not my word. It's God's word. Listen to me now. Follow me on this. It's God's word, not my word. I'm not going to get upset. So I can, I can shake the dust off my feet, which means do not carry the residue of rejection from one place to the other. I can, I can take that, shake that dust off my feet. Why? Because they rejected what the Lord had, not what I had. Now, why do people get so upset? Because we're going to have two corrections in this. When you carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to somebody, right, make sure it's his. How do you know when it's not his? It's when you want that person to believe in a specific narrative of the gospel. Then, listen to me, because you studied all week long and you deliver your message, but it's your message. Now it's yours. You give it to that person. They reject what you said. You take offense. Why? Because in that rejection that you labored and studied so hard to get to the other person, you gave that person your interpretation of God's word, which means it's your word too now, right? Isn't that right? It's your word too now. So when they reject it, you feel like they reject you too. Because you tied yourself into it. The Lord said to spread the gospel, not to spread our gospel. To spread his gospel, not to spread our gospel. Listen to me. There's no way anybody can get upset. I can't get upset with the sect deaf if I give him an envelope and he opens it up and starts cursing up a storm. I'm not going to get upset because he's rejecting the president's message. But if I take, if I give him a letter I wrote, added my two cents to it, and gave it to him, and it's mixed with the president's words and my words, and he gets upset, I'm going to feel like I'm rejected when he rejects that message. Why? Because I made myself a part of it. That means I'm the one out of order. I'm the one out of order. Hmm? It's very easy. When you carry the gospel, carry the gospel. Carry the gospel, especially when, when you're having a discussion with Christians, you can discuss. When you carry the gospel, carry the gospel. The gospel is powerful. It is full of power. 
our stuff has no power in it like that. So when we add our stuff to it, we water down the gospel. And somebody rejects it by catching a technicality. And then we get upset because we feel like they rejected us. When you're giving somebody the gospel, give them the gospel. If they don't receive it, then they didn't receive it. Shake the dust off your feet. Say, thank you, Lord. You keep going because, listen, see with me, if somebody rejects the gospel coming from me, it does not move me in the slightest way. Do you know why? My hope is that somebody reach them someday. It does not have to be me. See, when you love someone, you don't care where they get the help from. You care that they get the help. Did it make sense? All right, back to the back to the greater works than these where you do. We have to understand some things first, doing something in the name of Jesus. So he says, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified. So if you do something in the name of Jesus, you're not passing a message anymore. When you do something in the name of Jesus, oh, here it comes. It's just like doing I, if the president told me, Mike, I want you to go, I want you to go and sit in this meeting and I want you to take all the notes and then I want you to tell them to lock everything up when they're done. Okay. So I go sit down. They say, well, what are you doing here? The president sent me. Oh, everybody shuts up. Why? Because I'm sitting in the stead, in the place of the president. I am acting for the president. So when I sit down in that chair and I take notes, I am doing so in a presidential capacity. Now, at the end of the meeting, I tell everybody, by the president's order, you guys lock everything up. Now, they understand it's not me telling them to lock everything up. It's the president telling them to lock everything up. So then to do something in the name of the president is to do something in the stead or the place of the president. Now do you get it? So asking in the name of Jesus is not saying, Lord, give me a front door in the name of Jesus. No, it's to do something in the place of Jesus. But here's what happens. You ready? I'm not going to ask for something stupid and silly that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God standing in the place of Christ like an ambassador to Christ. It will be about the kingdom. It's not going to be about me. Do you get it now? When you ask for something in the name of Jesus, you're asking for something in the stead, in the place of Christ, which means it has to be something. Christ would also utilize. Hmm? See that? See how that, that will change everything you ask for. See, people out there in the world have told you to ask for everything silly, and that, that stuff has nothing to do with the kingdom half of it. When you ask for something in the stead of Christ, say you're near a brother who's sick, right? Now, naturally, you have compassion. You don't want that person sick. To ask for healing for that person in the name of Jesus is to stand in the place of Christ in that very moment. You're about to exercise some authority, real authority, not this fake stuff. Now, before you exercise that authority, you better know if God is working on this person, if that sickness is purposed or not. So you can't just walk up to anybody and exercise your will. You can't do that. You've got to be in tune with what? With the living God. You've got to know You've got to know what's going on in the kingdom. You've got to know what's going on in a person's life. Now, before you say, well, that's just crazy. Well, I guarantee you there are lots of people here in COT that will tell you otherwise. Because you know what they said? Mike, how did you know that about my life? Because the Holy Spirit will never have you talk to a stranger. That's why. If the Lord has me engage someone, the Lord will show me what he's doing in that person's life. In so doing, I know what not to interfere with. I know what's precious. 
I know what I'm not to touch or anything else. Now, listen to me. The Holy Ghost is reserved for those who obey him. Why? That's very important. Why? If the Lord discloses your life to me and I go run my mouth or have I, 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 my feelings change about you based on what I saw, I'm not fit to house the Holy Spirit. If I'm not going to love you because of a truth of you that does not look squeaky clean to me, I'm not fit for the Holy Ghost. So you got a lot of people out there. They fake it to make it. Don't ever do that with the living God. And if you've done that, cut all that out. Be real. If I see something detestable with a person, and God knows I have, and there are, there are thousands of people in COT that know, I don't tell a soul anything about anybody. People have told me things to test me. Well, let me see if he's going to say something about this. I don't say a thing to anybody. And when I say to anybody, I mean to no one. Angela will tell you the same thing. I don't talk about other people to other people. I don't do that. And if somebody tells me something, it's not going to cause me not to love them. People have told me some things that will cause the average person to hate them. You know what it does to me? It makes me work harder for them. I don't hate them at all. It makes me work harder. But the Lord will not have, he will not have me speak to a stranger. If I were one of those people, then I would learn something about somebody's life, and all of a sudden I'd be in shock, and then I would just have disdain for the person. God would never allow me to have his Holy Spirit. See, God knows everything about us. He knows everything about us. There has never been a time when he did not see you. So when you were doing that thing behind closed doors with the covers all the way over and you thought nobody could hear it, you were naked to the living God. Everything was seen. Every thought was known. Every intent was amplified. He knew everything and he does not turn away from you. So why in the world would he give that type of spirit to a person who's going to say yuck at everything they see as though they never send it all themselves? No, a child does that. That's what children do. They go yuck. They will always yuck something. But when you mature, you understand something. Not one of us can make it by ourselves. That this is a real plight. This isn't some game. This is for keeps. And eternity is eternal. And you don't want anybody to perish. So to do something in the stead of Christ is to be an ambassador to Christ. Listen, an ambassador to Christ that means you're standing in his place in the earth in that situation on the, in that very moment. You cannot be blind and do that. Because how would it be if God put a sickness on someone for their soul's correction? In other words, if he had not put the sickness on them, they would surely be condemned. Their soul would be condemned. Then you know and I know he's not going to let anybody interfere with that sickness. It is working something in that person's life, and for them it's going to be life or death. So why would he allow me with the Holy Spirit come and interrupt his work with his own spirit? That's foolishness, isn't it? So it will never happen. So you just can't walk up to a person, and because you have compassion, you heal them. No. Your eyes must be opened. Do you see that? That's a heavy responsibility, isn't it? But that's doing something in the name of Jesus. It also tells us we are not just to get salvation and quit. Well, I'm saved. Forget everybody else. That's it. That's not how it works. Not when we operate in truth. So, Jesus says, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Whatsoever, why would he say that? Because you're in line with the will of God. You're in line with the kingdom. You're not going to ask for something outside of what God is doing already. You won't. That means 
prior to this point, you're in tune. Do you hear me? Prior to this point, you're in tune. When you believe upon Jesus, you will pursue him, and he will raise you, and in time, things will change. One of our problems is this. The rhetoric in the world, most of it is violence against the word of God. There are lots of people speaking, and lots of people have guidance. They do. I hear it all the time. People say, well, what you need to do is this. Well, God wants us to do this, and God wants us to do that, and God wants us to do this and that. But see, the Lord gave us qualifiers. Who, we, who are we supposed to take advice from? See, I can listen to anybody. I can. I can, I can listen to anybody. But see, there are checks and balances that are in the Bible. Number one, the Lord said, if a man cannot bridle his own tongue, that man's religion is vain. We ought not do anything that person is doing because his own religion is not working for him. When he cannot temper, right, when he has a temper, he blows the, his top too many times, this and the other. That person, what they believe in, is not overpowering the simplicity of their flesh. How can the power working in them be worth anything if it can't even overcome the flesh? They certainly won't overcome another spirit. So God is saying if a person cannot bridle his own tongue, right, then what that person believes in is not working. And you should not follow somebody who has a belief that is not working. And it is true. If a person cannot bridle their tongue, they're spiritually weak. And whatever they believe in is adding no spiritual strength to them. Do you hear me? When I was young, I thought that was impossible for a person to bridle their tongue. But God proved me to be an idiot down the road. He did. He did. I believe in Christ. I believe in what Jesus believes in. Not what men believe in. Men make adjustments. I don't need to follow anybody who's going to make adjustments. I need the real deal because people are in trouble. My motivation is the salvation of people, the real salvation of people. Not distant salvation. Not the, just the, you know, well, I hope you get, I hope you're all right one day. Goodbye. No, not that. Not that. So to do something, to ask for something in the name of Jesus, there's a qualifier. Do you see that? What, whatsoever you ask in his name, he will do it. He'll do it because you're within his will and it will not fail. That means, in truth, when you ask for something in the name of Jesus, once you believe upon his name, once you believe upon him, he will do whatsoever you ask. Remember I told you guys, and it was quite bold, I said there's not been a prayer the Lord has not answered. But here's the key. I remember I shocked everybody. I, I said I never pray for me. I don't pray for myself. Never do. Do you know why? Because the Lord already promised to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Why would I ever have to pray for me? Why would I ever have to ask for things for me? So I don't do that. If the Lord said he's going to take care of me, I don't need to pray for anything for me because he already said he's going to take care of me. See, I like to walk by faith. Now, part of that, part of that, that following of Christ like that comes from being under somebody else's authority and learning how to obey orders from other people. No matter how high of a position you have, you're always going to have somebody over you. And if you cannot subject yourselves to authority, you're still full of rebellion. And you have to get rid of that rebellion first. Because once you subject yourself to the living God, you're not out to make big waves or anything like that. You tend to care about the smallest minute of things. It just accumulates and can become big without you even knowing it. So that means even if things get, if, if, the, if the, whatever you're doing grows, you'll never become prideful because of it. Why? Because you see the authentic side of it. See, it's never, you don't rush out to save everybody. No. It's just doing honest work for the one. 
Be real for the one. That's how that works. But it just keeps going. Obedience is everything. That's why it said the Holy Ghost is preserved for those who obey the Lord. It's for those who obey the Lord. Now, here's, here's another key. We can make those adjustments, but how many people fight against those adjustments and they don't know why? Think about it. Think about it. Hmm? Think about it. We are the ones that all too often refuse to do it the Lord's way. And a lot of cases, sometimes we'll always say, next time. Don't we? Next time, but next time. I'll get better at it this and the other. You don't have to say that anymore. Pursue it in honesty. Right? When, For example talking to you guys, right? I don't talk to anybody compromised. And what that means is, if I have anything against anybody, do you guys know I will not talk to you, nor will I handle the Word of God? I won't do it. Because I'm compromised. I will not speak compromised. If I'm upset about anything, I will not handle the Word of God. Because I'm compromised. If I have anything against any living soul, I will not touch the word of God nor handle it because I'm compromised and I will not talk to you. Here's what happens when you're compromised. Whatever you're compromised with comes out of your mouth in the subject of the Lord you're talking about. So we taint the word of God with our own disposition. For example, if somebody hurt you, then naturally you're going to take up the word of God And because somebody hurt you, you're going to start teaching everybody how to protect themselves from people who hurt, hurt others. Watch out for those people. They're going to get you. That's compromised. That's not the word of God. That's unsettled matters of our hearts. And we take the word of God, add our two cents into it that are laden with emotions we shouldn't have at that time. And then we taint the word, giving it to somebody else, giving them bad counsel. I was scared of something. I could not handle the word of God nor speak to you at that moment. I am compromised. He said, now come on, Eric, you better pray. Cover your heads and pray and hope that the Lord protects you because the word is compromised. That's not speaking in truth. That's not how Jesus gave us the word to speak. That's why in the Bible it says when you have an ought against your brother, Right? Leave your gift at the altar and go back and correct that thing with your brother. Then come back to the altar. You're unclean at that moment. You're tainted. You're compromised. And so whatever you speak. See, in the Bible it says, out of the mouth flows the issues of the what? Heart. So what happens when you have something in your heart that starts coming out of your mouth with the word of God? You have a messed up word. That's what happens. You have a messed up word. We are to be sober with the word of God. Ready in season and out of season. That means to handle the word of God is to entrust all your affairs to the most high. To cast your cares upon him and walk forward with Christ no matter what. Yeah, that is. Isn't that called honesty, though? We should know this about ourselves, correct? We should know this about ourselves. We should. I remember one time I was about to speak to you guys, and I turned the mic on and everything else, and I turned it right back off again. I did. I was in the wrong spirit. I was in the wrong spirit. Will not do it. That happened twice in COT. Twice. Twice. So now you know, doing something in the place of Jesus is to be an ambassador to Christ. That's when you ask for something in his name or do something in his name. You see that? To ask for something in his name means you're on the job. You're an ambassador to Christ, so whatever you're asking for has to be within the will of God. 
whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. And the Father, listen, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You see how that works. So if your asking is outside of the Son of the living God being glorified, you've already messed it. You're not within the will of God. And all you have to do, folks, listen, is learn to silence yourself in your own mind. Learn to put yourself last so that you can see everybody else. How do you put yourself last and see everybody else? You have to go over the word. And you see what the Lord says. He's got you. He's going to take care of you. And you trust in that word he's giving you. So that you're not worried about yourself going out through life. Because having you noticed that at least 60% of your time is tied up trying to take care of yourselves. Having you noticed it slows you down. It keeps you in a bad mood. And it's all about you. Haven't you noticed that? It's all about you. Has anybody noticed that? You sit down, you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about your circumstances. You're thinking about this. You're thinking about that. And it's all about you, and it's tying up your time. And you really don't have time to focus on other things, and it can really compromise you. And you hate the fact that it sets you back. You don't like the fact that it gets into your mind and it permeates all throughout your body and messes up other things. You don't like that. And you want to trust the Lord to take care of you. See, what you need is the foundation that you can read. You need the scriptures, the places. In other words, you need God's word. You don't need my word. You need God's word. But you need to see it. Because after you see it, you can look into it and say, okay, now, I see it. Now, let me, let me walk this out in accepting this. Come on, stubborn mind. Let me just go ahead and accept God's word. He's going to watch after me. That's why it messes people up when I say I don't pray for myself. I don't pray for myself when the Messiah prays for me. He intercedes for me. He intercedes for you, too. I need not pray for myself. Now, I've noticed something about that, too. I know it flies in the face of so much. But if the Lord said he's going to take care of us, why would I ever have to take care of myself? If he said he's going to supply my needs according to his riches and glory, why should I ask for anything for me? I don't do that. I do ask for things for you. There are so many times I'll say, Lord, I need wisdom to talk to so-and-so. That's the kind of stuff I ask for. Not tangible things. I really don't. But I do ask for wisdom a lot. I do. There have been a couple of hard cases, and I said, Lord, I, I know what this means, but I don't have the patience to deal with this person. I need the patience, and yes, I know what it means. Because when you ask for patience, there's only one way to acquire patience. You guys know what that is, right? You have to have a workout with your patience. That means somebody is coming into your life. That's going to get on every nerve that you have. That's what it means. That's the only way to gain patience. Patience has to be exercised. But I needed that. And I knew what I was asking. Because this person, they needed someone and no one was going to them. That's the kind of stuff I ask for. I do. Is it easy sometimes? No, it is not. But that's where faith comes. Faith See, when you do something by faith, it doesn't mean you're happy all the time. It means you're trusting in the Lord. See, when you're trusting in someone, right? Listen to me. When you're trusting in someone initially, initially it's the hardest part because you say, wait a minute. <sighs> now, if I give this over to you, Lord, you know I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to take another thought about it. I refuse to think about it. You've got it. That's when you cast your cares upon the Lord. That's the hardest part deciding to do it in the first place. And so I ultimately do those things, and I will not revisit that subject again. And in every single case since I've been doing that, guess what? The Lord has been faithful by his word to do exactly what he said he would do. And I'm always, I'm always amazed by that. People, I think, they do their best to give you their methods. But here's something with mankind. What works for one may not work for the other. 
But I do know this. When you operate in obedience, the Lord's word never fails. The Lord's word never fails any way we do. We fail to meet the standard of God's word so much. Because we listened to the word through the grapevine, and we didn't hear it directly from the horse's mouth. And we start doing things that are just strange and weird. There are lots of things that sound logical. But I'll tell you right now, they have no root in the spiritual reality we are involved with. The Lord's word is the Lord's word. And when you have faith in the Lord's word, it means you have decided to trust it. Trust is something you decide. I know a lot of people say, well, you know, you have to earn trust. No, you don't. Or trust is not earned. Who made up that nonsense? When you meet somebody and they have, done, they have not done anything against you, you automatically trust them until that trust is broken. Trust is not earned. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. Can you all see that? Huh? My goodness. We give people trust until that trust is broken. They don't earn the trust. See, we we believe we believe in some of the silliest things that have no basis in reality, and we really do operate by them. And we start believing our own rhetoric. That's another example. Just giving you guys an example. It is true, we are. We're a young species. Yes, we're somewhat insane, but that's okay. It's all right. We're going to make it with the Lord, but the Lord will make it. By ourselves, not so much. We, we're not too bright by ourselves. But hopefully you see that now. So he said, now here, here it is. He said, he said, greater things, the works that I do, you're going to do too. And he said, in greater works than these, because I go into the Father. Now, this is the part that requires your absolute attention. It does. Listen, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Listen, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? That was John 14, 15 through 18. Let me read that one more time. Jesus is talking. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. He just told you, he just told you who this second comforter was. He just told you that. You all, did, I, I shouldn't have to explain this. You heard it yourselves. You heard it. Now, here's the problem. Let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is there's a book over here, you know, telling everybody what somebody thinks that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is. There's another doctrine over here which tells you what they think the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is. There's another doctrine over here that's doing the same thing and the same thing and the same thing. But the word is saying it quite simply. It's coming from the horse's mouth. It's coming from Jesus of Nazareth. Now listen, I'll break it down to you. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Well, what happened to the first one? When he sent the disciples out two by two. He gave, he told them what? Don't take anything with you. You know, when you start reading the book of Acts, it says, hey, did I, did I tell you to take anything? No. Did you lack anything? No. They, he, they said, no. 
And the disciples didn't like anything. Why? Because Jesus was that command and fulfillment element in the earth. Do you see that? The Holy Ghost descended upon Jesus like a dove. Right? And he was sent into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. But as concerning the disciples, Jesus gave them the commands. You see that? Jesus did that. And they lacked nothing. Hmm? So he was the first comforter. Listen, he says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. That's the same phrase Jesus said that he would do with you anyway. He said, even the spirit of truth, that's an additional explanation as to what it is, whom the world cannot receive. Does the world have the spirit of truth? No, it does not receive Christ. The world is against Christ. Jesus said the world tried to kill him, so it'll try and kill you too. It hated him, it's going to hate you too, right? Whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. The world did not know Jesus either. And all those who were of that worldly spirit sat there and looked in the face of the Messiah and said, you're not the Messiah. And Jesus called them a brood of vipers. Let's continue. He says, but you know him. He's talking to his disciples. He said, but you know him. For he dwelleth with you, listen, and shall be in you. Did you hear that? Jesus said to his disciples, the world doesn't know him, but you know him because he dwells with you and shall be in you. My goodness, how simple of an explanation is that? Now, Jesus already said one cannot testify of himself. And so he's speaking in a consistency with that same principle. I'll say it again. He said, he said, the world, the world cannot receive the spirit of truth because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Listen, but he continues. He says, uh, and I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He didn't say, I will not leave you comfortless. Something else is coming. Nope. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I, I will come to you. Down do you see it. So what are we facing here? Why so much confusion? Because you have men's doctrines. And you have the absolute word of the living God. And you have experts sitting in places like kings and queens, and they like to do that, demanding that everybody believe the way they believe. But when you read the word of God yourself, which is what they tried to stop a long time ago, when you read this word by yourself, you start seeing things that just don't fit the paradigm of these people, do they? Huh? I know it's a conflict because you'll read something, you'll say, I never saw that before. I, but so-and-so's book says, what we're reading right now is in context, too. We're not taking a scripture out and then having a six-hour speech on one phrase. That's not what we're doing. We saw what was before it. We're going to see what's after it so that we can see the whole thing in context. Where you, anybody can pull a scripture out and turn it into just about anything they want. That's called not having context. That's very dangerous. That's how cults have killed people, have led people to slaughter. Because they pull things out of context. I'm not the one who's right. The father is. This is not, don't listen, don't listen to me like I've just figured this out. This is the father's word has been here this entire time. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you, John 14 or, or 18. He says, and in a little while, the world see me no more, but ye see me because I live. You shall live also. He's telling them everything. Listen. Listen, he says, 
At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. See, at the beginning he said, if you love me, keep my commandments, plural, not just one. Jesus gave us two specific things. And he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Here he's saying, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he's the one that loves me. The one that keeps the commandments of Jesus are the ones who, not the ones who say, I love you, Lord, but the ones who keep his commandments. Those are the ones who love him. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. That's what many are missing that right now. They're missing the manifestation. Not that Jesus is going to appear and come in your room with a jacket on and some pants and a shirt. No, not that way. He already told us how he would manifest. See, everything he speaks, he then qualifies. My goodness. But people keep pulling things out of context and making up stories. Judas, Judas, saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us? And not unto the world. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the Lord which ye hear is, and the word which ye hear is not mine but my fathers which sent me these things i have spoken unto you being you being yet present with you he said but the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever i have said unto you did you hear that jesus said whatsoever i have said unto you the holy spirit is going to teach you Huh? He's going to bring it back. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. Now remember, Judas just said, how are we going to know? How in the world are you going to manifest yourself unto us and not the world? And Jesus starts to tell him. He starts telling him. Now listen, he told him, and he's telling him this, peace I leave with you. Oh, Jesus, how are you going to? How are you going to show you manifest yourself unto us and not the world? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto my father. For the father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, you might believe. That was so important. Huh? He said, hereafter, I will not talk much with you. Oh, this is a good one. For the prince of the world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do arise, let us go hence. Lord Jesus gave so much in that. See, a lot of people do not have the peace of Christ. Jesus said, I leave you my peace. So when you have the peace of Christ, I'm telling you now, your troubles cannot stay. And people are missing that. Why are they missing that? Don't think of, listen, don't think of something that you're doing purposely against God. That's not what's happening. Jesus kept talking about his commandments, floor, but he gave. And in his commandments, that's what people are ignoring. The world is teaching you how to hate people, right? I hope you know that's forbidden of the living God. That is breaking one of his commandments. The world is teaching you to have a target, to hate someone. They don't care who it is, so long as you have someone to point to, to talk to, to hate. And yes, that means politically, too. So long as you do this, you can have, you cannot be settled inside because you're not keeping the commandments of Christ. You're just not doing. If you keep the commandments of Christ, you have no targets in the earth. You have none. The world is teaching you 
how to partake of its own curse. And have you noticed that the more people who listen to the rhetoric of the world, the more violent they become? Have you noticed? You know what that means? That means there are people in this world that I wouldn't hire, right? I wouldn't hire those people to change a light bulb, but I love them to pieces. How do I love them? I do not want to see Satan stand victorious in their lives. When I see a person out there that's just evil, doing all sorts of things, let me share this with you. I see a war, and I believe the Word of God. The Word teaches us we wrestle not against the flesh, but principalities and powers and, you know, spiritual weakness in high places. So when I see a person like that, that everybody calls evil in this and the other, I see a person losing against Satan. And I have a constant prayer for all people like that. See, because what you don't know, as I, too, was compromised at one point. Suppose people would have looked at me, how evil of a person he is, and no one would have encouraged me with the word of God. Huh? See, that's what you don't know. When I see people out there, it doesn't matter. They could be the worst person in the world. They could do a slight. They could be picking boogers too much or something like that and offend the whole community. Either way, they're engaging in sin. And when a person engages in sin, Satan has already deceived them. That person is losing. That person is dying. I will not abandon a person to death like that. I'm not going to do it. I, there's something I will do. I will seek of the Lord. What can I do? That's my first step. I'll always pray for the person. I know they have a choice to make, but I am not one to stand in this world in this grace, era of grace and mercy. The Lord has not come back yet. So right now, God has not condemned a soul. Everybody has a chance. Who am I to condemn someone that God says, nope, I'm going to give them life this day. They still have a chance. Yeah, I actually do love my fellow man. I desire a victory for my fellow man through salvation. I do not want to see anybody in the clutches of Beelzebub himself to be totally and absolutely deceived, have their brains mixed up like jello. Some of you right now, you may be struggling for months, and I'll tell you this, the reason why there's still a practice you hold. You don't have to hold that practice. You can be free from it, but you've got to decide to be free. Even in thinking about it, you recognize an internal struggle of something that's not you. You know there's something that's not you waiting at your home to enter back into your mind, back into that struggle. You can go out. You can start having a clear mind and everything else. You come right back to your home. Something is waiting on you with the same old arguments. Sometimes you give in for the sake of peace because that's the only way you know how to obtain peace is to simply give in for a moment. There is another way. Something that's very delicate to investigate because most people will not agree with it. Although it's written in the Bible, I'm telling you now, most people will not agree with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they say it's not forceful enough. It's not violent enough. There's no action in it, they say. They're the very ones that have no peace. And they can't have peace. Not until they choose the Lord's way. Nobody can force anybody to take the Lord's way. It must be something you honestly choose. And guess what? I'm one of those people who will encourage as long as I can, as long as, it, as long as the Lord gives me time. I'll use that time to encourage. But everybody can make that choice. I'm not here to condemn. That's why I do not condemn. I don't. Many ask me at least three, four, five times a week, how come you don't condemn anybody? You know, they're doing this. And I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Because for every point I condemn them on, I could be condemned by the living God on more points. 
If I condemn them, my Heavenly Father will condemn me. The only reason people condemn others is because their things are obvious. How many things do you have in your life that are not obvious? And so nobody condemns you because they don't know about it. Suppose God disclosed everything about you. See, then all of us would be in the same boat, wouldn't we? All of us would be found lacking, wouldn't we? But God didn't do that, did he? He did not expose everything about you to everybody. So when a, somebody gets up in front of the world and everything about them is exposed, all of a sudden everybody says, oh, look how awful. My, my, you're still seeing the splinter in somebody else's eye. And they're walking around with a telephone pole in their eye. Do you see how the scriptures come alive? How they're applicable to everything you would ever go through. We have to choose to get this right. And if we choose to get ourselves right and to get this right, you know what happens? The Lord will see it through. If you choose to fully believe upon his name, which is to believe in his gospel, which is to believe in those things he taught, which is to accept the cross, to accept your role, and your identity. Should you do that? Should you do that? Your change will no longer, has it? It's when you go to a brand new level. Now you know. That's when the troubles change. See, do I still have trouble in my life? Yes. Why don't they bother me? Because I can understand them now. See, when you have no understanding as to why something is happening, that's when you're in trouble. When you understand why something is happening, you can rejoice. Do you hear me? You can rejoice when you understand why something is happening. You cannot rejoice when you don't know why this keeps happening to you. But as soon as you find out why and you know what it is, that's when you rejoice. That's what every single last one of you can have. If you don't have it, you can have it. That's based on a simple choice. It really is. And that choice is 100% up to you. All right, folks, I'm not going to hold you hostage. Listen, we have a talk tomorrow, so anything I didn't cover tonight concerning critical things we'll discuss tomorrow in our talk that may be a bit longer than usual. I'm somewhat long-winded these days for some reason, but I'll be here to talk to you guys tomorrow for sure, okay? I'll update the times on the website. I'll do that. We're going to do that tomorrow. Critical information, we'll do that tomorrow. We're going to talk about all that same subject at once. It's a very sober one. But I was led in a different direction tonight. Forgive me for that. Folks, God bless each of you. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll update the schedule for tomorrow. So get ready for that. God bless and keep all of you. Someone say, hey, don't threaten me with a good time. God bless you, sir. You guys have a good one. Pray for each other. Work with each other. And do me a favor. Hmm? Hold each other up as best you can. Do that. God bless and keep all of you. I'll see you tomorrow right here at COT.